Good morning, guys. It's February 19th. It's Friday. It's payday. It's been a long week, guys. Hope today that most of you guys have a great day, and I hope your light shines everywhere you go. So, I'm going to be in Isaiah chapter 60, and the verse of the day is verse 1, and here's what it says. Arise, Jerusalem, let your light shine for all to see, for the glory of the God rises to shine on you. Ain't that great? If we can let our light shine, then His glory of the Lord rises to shine on us. So by us showing our light, the Lord's going to be putting light on us with His glory. Amen. So, chapter 60 of Isaiah. Let's see what's going on here. The beginning of this book. Once I get the pages split apart, then I'll be able to so, the words of comfort is what we're going to be reading out of, and the chapters, the 27 chapters in the second half of Isaiah generally bring a message of forgiveness, comfort, and hope. This message of hope looks forward to coming, the coming of the Messiah. Isaiah speaks more about the Messiah than, than does any other Old Testament prophet. He describes the Messiah as both a suffering servant and a sovereign Lord. The fact that the Messiah was to be both a suffering servant and a sovereign Lord could not be understood clearly until New Testament times based on what Jesus Christ has done. God freely offers forgiveness to all who turn to Him in faith. This is God's message of comfort to us because those who need heed it find eternal peace and fellowship with Him. The future kingdom, future glory for Jerusalem. Arise, O Jerusalem, let your light shine for all to see, for the glory of the Lord rises to shine on you. Darkness as black as night covers all the nations of the earth, but the glory of the Lord rises and appears over you. All nations will come to your light, mighty kings will come to see your radiance. Look and see, for everyone is coming home. Your sons are coming from distant lands. Your little daughters will be carried home. Your eyes will shine and your heart will thrill with joy. For merchants from around the world will come to you. They will bring you the wealth of many lands. Vast caravans of camels will converge on you. The camels of Midian and Ephah. The people of Sheba will bring gold and frankincense and will come worshiping the Lord. The flocks of Kedar will be given to you, and the rams of Nebaioth will be brought from my altars. I will accept their offers, and I will make their make my kingdom or temple glorious. And what do I see flying like clouds to Israel, like doves to their nests? They are ships from the ends of the earth, from lands that trust in me, led by the great ships of Tarshish. They are bringing the people of Israel home. From far away, they will honor the Lord for God, the Holy One of Israel, for He has filled you with splendor. Foreigners will come to rebuild your towns, and their kings will serve you. For though I have destroyed you in my anger, I will have now have mercy on you through my grace. Your gates will stay open day and night to receive the wealth of many lands. The kings of the world will be led as captives in the victory procession for the nations that refuse to serve you will be destroyed the glory of lebanon will be yours and forests of cypress fir and pine to beautiful to beautify my sanctuary my temple will be glorious the descendants of your tormentors will come and bow before you though who despised you will kiss your feet they will call you the city of the Lord and Zion of the Holy One of Israel. Though you were once despised and hated and no one traveling through you, I will make you a beautiful forever. A joy to all nation, generations. Powerful kings and mighty nations will satisfy your every need as though you were a child nursing at the breast of a queen. You will know 
at last that I, the Lord, I am your Savior. The Lord I am your Savior and your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Israel. I'll exchange your bronze for gold, your iron for silver, your wood for bronze, and your stones for iron, and I will make peace your leader in righteousness, your ruler. So peace will be our leader and righteousness will be our ruler. Violence will disappear from your land. The desolation and destruction of war will end. Salvation will surround you like city walls. And praise will be on your lips of all who enter there. Wow. No longer will you need the sun to shine by day, nor the moon to give its light by night. For the Lord your God will be your everlasting light, and your God will be your glory. Your sun will never set, your moon will never go down, for the Lord will be your everlasting light. Your days of mourning will come to an end. All your people will be righteous. They will possess their land forever. For I will plant them there with my own hands in order to bring myself glory. The smallest family will become a thousand people, and the tiniest group will become a mighty nation. At the right time, I, the Lord, will make it happen. The Lord's powerful. We don't need any light but His. We have to take a... Well, okay. Scratch back. Rewind. Zzz. The initiative against drudgery. I don't know what drudgery means, but it doesn't sound sound like something you want to do. We have to take the first step as though there were no God. It is no use to wait for God to help us. He will not. But immediately we arise, we find He is there. Whenever God inspires, the initiative is a moral one. We must do the thing and not lie like a log. If we will arise and shine, drudgery becomes divinely transfigured. Drudgery is one of the finest touchstones of character there is. Drudgery is work that is very far removed from anything to do with the ideal. <clears throat> the utterly mean grubby things, and when we come in contact with them, we know instantly whether or not we are spiritually real. Read John 13. Well, let me go to John 13. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Luke. John. Okay, 13. Man, you got a bunch of stuff in your Bible. It makes it hard to turn. Stuff. Man. I got a double dipper today. I'm going to read two chapters. Jesus teaches his disciples. Jesus washes the disciples' feet. This is chapter 13. Before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave this world and return to his Father. He had loved his disciples during his ministry on earth, and now he loved them to the very end. It was time for supper, and the devil had already prompted Judas, son of Simon Iscarlot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything, and that he had come from God and would return to God. So he got up from the table, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist, and poured water into a basin. Then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel he had around them, around him. When Jesus came to Simon Peter, Peter said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, You don't understand now what I am doing, but someday you will. No, Peter protested, you will never ever wash my feet. Jesus replied, Unless I wash you, you won't belong to me. Simon Peter explained, Then wash my hands and my head as well, Lord, just not my, not just my feet. Jesus replied, A person who is bathed all over does not need to wash, except for the feet, to be entirely clean. And you disciples are clean, but not all of you. 
for Jesus knew who would betray him. That is what he meant when he said, Not all of you are clean. After washing their feet, he put on his robe again and sat down and asked, Do you understand what I was doing? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right because that's what I am. And since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. I have given you an example to follow, do as I have done to you. I tell you the truth. Slaves are not greater than their master, nor the messenger more important than the one who sends the message. Now that you know these things, God will bless you for doing them. I am not saying these things to all of you. I know the ones I have chosen. But this fulfills the scripture that says, The one who eats my food is turned against me. I tell you this beforehand so that when it happens, you will believe that I am the Messiah. I tell you the truth. Anyone who welcomes my messenger is welcome to me, and anyone who welcomes me is welcoming the Father who sent me. Jesus and the disciples shared the Last Supper. Now Jesus was deeply troubled, and he exclaimed, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at each other, wondering whom he could could mean the disciple Jesus was loved was sitting next to Jesus at the table Simon Peter mentioned to him to ask who is he talking about so the disciple leaned over to Jesus and asked Lord who is it Jesus responded it is the one whom I give bread I dip in the bowl and when he dipped it he gave it to Judas son of Simon Iscariot when Judas had eaten the bread Satan entered into him the Jesus, then Jesus told him, hurry and do what you're going to do. None of the others at the table knew what Jesus meant. Since Judas w was their treasurer, some thought Jesus was telling him to go and pay for the food or to give some money to the poor. So Judas left at once, going out into the night. Jesus predicts Peter's denial. As soon as Judas left the room, Jesus said, the time has come for the Son of Man to enter into His glory, and God will be glorified because of Him. And since God receives glory because of the Son, He will soon give glory to the Son. Dear children, I will be with you only a little longer, and as I told the Jewish leaders, you will search for me, but you can't come where I'm going. So I'm, now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Simon Peter asked, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus replied, You can't go with me now, but you will follow me later. But why can't I come now, Lord? He asked. I'm ready to die for you. Jesus answered, Die for me? I tell you the truth, Peter. Before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny three times that you even know me. I read this yesterday out of Matthew. And it's literally almost the same same thing, but it's definitely different because this is written by John. Pretty powerful. Powerful. He only wanted to wash their feet. Hmm. There's a lot of message in there. So we read John 13. We see there... The incarnate God doing the most desperate piece of drudgery, washing fishermen's feet. And he says, If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one's, one another's feet. Let us wash one another's feet. It requires the inspiration of God to go through drudgery with the light of God upon it. Some people do a certain thing in the way in which they do it hollows that thing forever afterwards. It may be the most commonplace thing, but after we have seen them do it, it becomes different. When the Lord does a thing through us, He always transfigures it. Our Lord took on Him our human flesh and transfigured it, and it has become for every saint the temple of the Holy Ghost. Man, that's powerful. Beautiful message today. Let us be the light that shines. And then God's glory will be the light that shines on us.
Amen. All right, guys. God bless you all. Have a blessed day. I'm out of here.